جی صاحب السلام علیکم ورحمۃ اللہ وبرکاتہ ہم عارفہ مظفر ہماری جانب سے آپ تمام کو خوش آمدید اینڈ آج کا پروگرام جو ہم نے ترتیب دیا ہے آئی ہیو اے ونڈرفل پرسن میڈیکل ڈاکٹر اور ریسرچر اراؤنڈ دا ورلڈ آپ نے لیکچرز بھی دیے ہیں میں ڈاکٹر اینتھنی لیڈس کا ذکر کر رہی ہوں بنیادی طور پہ ہی از ان انگلینڈ اور وزٹنگ پروفیسر ہیں فیکلٹی آف سائنس یونیورسٹی آف کوبن ہیگن کے ساتھ اس کے علاوہ اسکول آف ہیلتھ سائنس کے بیچ میں انٹرنیشنل میڈیکل یونیورسٹی کوالا لمپور ملیشیا اور ان کا ریسرچ جو یہ کر رہے ہیں موٹاپے کے اوپر اور موٹاپا لیڈ کرتا ہے بہت ساری بیماریوں کی طرف اینڈ دا موسٹ امپورٹنٹ اینڈ دا سیریس ون از ڈائبٹیز سو ڈائبٹیز کے بارے میں ان ادر ورڈس بھی سے اٹس سائلنٹ کلر اینڈ ساؤتھ ایشینس ہم بہت ساری چیزوں کو اگنور کر کے اپنی زندگی میں گزار رہے ہوتے ہیں تو وٹ از ڈائبٹیز یہ آئی جسٹ کیم اکراس سم بری اور میں نے اسے جب کہا کہ تم ابھی سو سیڈ نو مائی ہائٹ از دیٹ مچ اینڈ مائی مسل ویٹ از دیٹ مچ اینڈ دین دا پرسن اسٹارٹیڈ لوکنگ ان سے یس آئی ایم ابیز بیکاز اتنی ہائٹ اور ایج کے بعد آپ کا ویٹ کتنا ہونا چاہیے اس بارے میں ہم بات کریں گے ڈاکٹر اینتھنی لیٹ ہمارے ساتھ ہوں گے جیسا میں نے آپ سے پہلے ذکر کیا میڈیکل ڈاکٹر ہیں ریسرچر ہیں مختلف یونیورسٹیز میں لیکچرز دیتے ہیں بے شمار آرٹیکلز لکھے بے شمار کتابیں آپ نے لکھیں اینڈ آئی ڈو ہیو این ادر ونڈرفل پرسن اینڈ دیٹ از ڈاکٹر مرتضا حیدر ڈاکٹر مرتضا حیدر یہیں رائٹسن یونیورسٹی میں آپ پڑھاتے بھی ہیں آپ بھی میں بلکہ اٹس امیزنگ ان کی لائف بھی اور ڈاکٹر صاحب ہر چیز کی اسٹیٹس ڈیپ ڈاؤن جا کے اکٹھے کرتے ہیں اینڈ آئی تھینک ڈاکٹر مزا حیدر کہ اپنے انہوں نے قیمتی وقت میں سے انہوں نے بھی اس کے لیے ٹائم نکالا بیکاز آر ہیلتھ از دی موسٹ امپورٹنٹ تھنگ اور ہم بہت ساری چیزوں کو اگنور کر رہے ہوتے ہیں اپنی زندگی میں ڈاکٹر مزا حیدر فرسٹ آئی وڈ لائک ٹو ویلکم یو ان دا شو السلام علیکم وعلیکم السلام And as you have seen the profile of Dr. Anthony Leeds, uh, Dr. Anthony Leeds is also with me from UK. Dr. Anthony Leeds, I welcome you to the show. Good you afternoon you. and how you. are you? I'm fine, thank you very much indeed. How is UK doing these days? Um, it's, well, from the weather point of view, it's very cold and snowing at the moment, but uh, uh, we are actually doing very well in terms of... Um, addressing the vaccination requirements at the moment apparently um obviously there are many many challenging aspects it's a very complex this is a new disease with many complex characteristics and my younger colleagues who have to manage individuals who have this condition in hospital the covid 19 infection uh, tell me how very difficult it is sometimes to manage some individuals and of course the, t- the statistics given by the media uh, tell us the terrible devastation that it has caused. Uh, Dr. Muzahedar, if you would like to add anything on, you are more than welcome any time. Uh, but uh, would you like to say something, Dr. Muzah? Absolutely. I'm, I'm really delighted to be here with Dr. Leeds. And um, my interest in this, this conversation is uh, predicated on the fact that there is a tremendous amount of uh, uh, working from home going on these days, which mm-hmm. we call teleworking. Um, and um, in April of 2020, last year, Statistics Canada, our official um, uh, body that takes care of all the stats in, uh, in the country, they reported that uh, 40% of the labor force was working from home in mm-hmm. April and May. And then in January, when we went, um, went into another lockdown, they reported that the numbers had increased, which means that a growing number of people are now working from home. And the amount of daily exercise that they would reluctantly have by walking to the train station or the mm. transit systems or going about their lives. Even that is no longer taking place. And in other strict lockdown conditions, uh, uh, it's even more restrictive. At one point, sometimes in summer, Paris decided to forbid people from running in or walking into the parks and whatnot. So mm. um, I'm afraid this, this increasing uh, stay at home Uh, restrictions on mobility and accessibility uh, would worsen the already challenging situation with obesity. And in particular, the South Asian community, um, in diaspora, not as much, but especially in their home countries in India and Pakistan, 
um, struggle with obesity with an additional challenge of not having enough playgrounds or parks because this so densely populated that what we take for granted here as to going out for a walk on a quiet street or going for a walk in a park um, those parks and quiet streets and neighborhood playgrounds do not exist in most of South Asia that's India Pakistan Bangladesh even Afghanistan yeah. Yeah. And then when these individuals arrive in, in, in Europe and North America, and England has a very long history of South Asian diaspora there, um, they bring the same uh, um, diet and uh, culinary habits and uh, traditions with them, and, but the temperature changes, like it's no longer that hot here, but you're consuming the same amount of butter as you did when you were overseas. So all sorts of these things make the obesity challenge a, a particular challenge not just for COVID during COVID-19, but also for the South Asian community. And I, we believe that the, uh, the numbers are slightly worse off for South Asians in diaspora than the larger population. So in that context, I'm looking forward to hearing from you as to how one can um, address this issue. What, what are the challenges with nutrition? Is there any hope or are we condemned to be obese? <laughs> Uh, I, I think the answer to that is there are several several issues there, aren't there? The first one is re in relation to physical activity, and it is, of course, extraordinarily difficult to uh, maintain the several, same level over the whole day if you're spending so much time at home and are, strictly speaking, not allowed to go out unless, um, unless you have a very good reason to do so. Um, so I think that governments around the world and health departments will have to take account... Um, perhaps from now onwards, although this is an extraordinary situation that nobody has faced before, um, at least not for a hundred years, and a hundred years ago, of course, the understanding of what the uh, pandemic was caused by was not as great as it is now. I mean, we've been very fortunate to see such terrific, very rapid advances in the science and understanding and the technology and the development of vaccines and so on, which will mean that we can address this all much more quickly. Um, however, what I would say is that I, I, I do think that globally governments failed to address the underlying issues which have proved to be uh, complicating factors for infection with COVID-19. So many of us have spent decades trying to encourage our medical colleagues and administrators and departments of health and uh, undertaking research in order to provide the evidence that enables us to address the problems of obesity, for example. And I have colleagues in Glasgow and Newcastle who've recently published a study on diabetes remission. Uh, so you develop uh, type 2 diabetes. If you lose enough weight, you can reverse it back to where it was before you drifted towards it. One, ha one has to remember, of course, there are modifiable risk factors and there are non-modifiable risk factors. And I'm afraid that age is one of those risk factors that you cannot modify. And as people become older, they become more at risk of diabetes. But there are modifiable ones, such as um, body weight, uh, diet, the components of diet, and of course, physical activity. Um, now, different groups of people in different populations have different habits and I'm uh, in the older age group and uh, throughout life perhaps I haven't been as physically active as I should have been so I do not have habits that are particularly good well, now that I'm sitting here I'm actually sitting in my at my home desk uh, where I spend quite a lot of time when I'm not doing the laundry and then clearing out the kitchen and so on and uh, the total amount of physical activity is nothing like as great as it would have been normally where I'd have gone out and walked two, three, four, five kilometers a day. But also older people perhaps are not as used to doing the resistance training that many younger people do. And uh, I have to admit that I've got some of the kit here, but I don't use it very often because it's just not part of my basic habit. And I think what we will need to have is a lot of help. Um, different groups will need different types of help, but we will have to do both aerobic and resistance training on a regular basis, even if we're stuck at home and can't get out. That takes a lot of effort. I'm sure a small segment of the community are actually doing this, but I suspect that a large proportion are not. And as you know, the published, recently published papers do show weight gain in the population samples that have been examined. So we're going to see an increased prevalence of obesity across the globe it was already very high, it was already a serious problem that had not been addressed. And we know that there are many conditions that are associated with um, obesity, diabetes obviously one of them, but many others, like difficulty with sleeping, with obstructive sleep apnea, um, osteoarthritis, 
And again, we have to bear in mind that with an age, a global aging population, the conditions that tend to get worse with age, like osteoarthritis, again, it's like diabetes. If you live long enough, you'll probably get osteoarthritis, just as if you live long enough, you may well get diabetes. Um, and we know that weight plays a part in osteoarthritis as well. And I work in Copenhagen at the Arthritis Institute, where we've shown very clearly that a weight loss of 10 kilograms, um, one, about one and a half stone, will actually... Uh, improve the condition. You can't reverse it, but you can actually improve the condition, reduce the pain, make the individual more mobile. And some of our patients in Copenhagen have gone from being unable to, for example, get up off the floor if they play with their grandchildren, to being able to move again, and some of them are back on their bicycles. So we do have an intervention there. However, what I should add is that what we've been doing recently is testing out new types of uh, dietary intervention, which are not yet really fully accepted across the globe. Um, in your guidelines for the management of uh, um, o overweight and obesity for Canada, uh, there are some specific recommendations about different types of diet. And one of the formula diets that is available in Canada is recommended as being something that can be used. And our work in Denmark has been on the use of that type of diet where for a period of a few weeks you don't eat conventional food, you use formula diet, you get more rapid weight loss than you might otherwise do and therefore you can achieve the weight targets that are needed to get the health benefits. And that's another thing that we've also learned recently is that it seems to be the case that for different conditions in order to get the benefit whether it's the improvement in the metabolism in diabetes or the reduction in inflammation in the joint in osteoarthritis you need enough weight loss to change the dynamics of the flows through the metabolic pathways and the various signaling compounds in the body so that you can actually change the underlying metabolism relating to the disease and those amounts of weight loss are not the one two or three pounds or a few kilograms that can be achieved by usual diets of sub making a few substitutions and cutting down portions of, which are very good things to do i should say and one should always encourage everybody to do those but most people rarely achieve 10 kilograms weight loss on that some people can i know i've seen people do it but if what we're trying to do is find ways of helping large groups of people to achieve good results most of the time we do randomized controlled trials properly designed so the results are acceptable to the guideline writers and so on um, so how, do, how does one go about this let's say I'm picking on the numbers you mentioned, like 10 kilograms, that's 22 pounds, right? Yep. That's a sizable amount of weight loss and some, like, I would be very happy if I'm able to achieve this. So yep. what basic changes in diet and lifestyle would I have to make um, to see this as a, an achievable target? And how long should that effort be? Like how, how, how long or how much, uh, is it a week, uh, is it a month, a year? Um, because we have here in, in Canada um, some medical practitioners who have these drastic diets uh, that they can they promise um, that one can lose up to 10 pounds, 10 to 15 pounds in a month, and they ha and I've, I've seen them with, with enough literature that they actually are able to do so. The challenge is what you mentioned in your in your conversation earlier in your remarks that it, unless it's a habit, um, it's not going to sustain. So. Right. Um, a rapid weight loss through a medical intervention or um, a formula diet, you will reach, reach that target if you are disciplined yeah. enough. But then how would you, how, how does one turn it into a habit, right? Yes, so what you've done there is, is raise the, the difficult question of weight maintenance. Um, and so really there are several phases to this process and you're absolutely right that in the past the offerings that uh, scientists have produced and uh, um, medical scientists, nutrition scientists and so on have been ones which are effective but perhaps not sustainable and an awful lot of um, healthcare practitioners still, still feel that rapid weight loss is probably not a good thing uh, because you will then regain the weight uh, and of course one of our efforts recently has been to try to demonstrate uh, in repeat, repeatable and usable and doable methods that you can actually maintain the weight. Um, before we just come back to that, though, I think we need also to remember that uh, across the broad spectrum of what is available, and I should say that in Canada, you have a very active group of uh, physicians and dietitians and research scientists working within the Obesity Association, led by Ari Sharma in Edmonton, who uh, is a very active dynamic teacher and uh, in Canada I think you're much more fortunate than in some other countries where perhaps there's not as much activity and the offerings that are available of course depend on the individual 
circumstances and condition of the patient, the amount of comorbidities, the amount of weight, how heavy is the person, in other words, how much fat, extra fat, is there in the body and what are the metabolic consequences what are they currently being treated for and then your options that are available are conventional diet special kinds of diet medications which have different types of actions and also of course bariatric surgery and one of the interesting things we're seeing in uh, let's say western populations at the moment is a, a change in the shape of the distribution curve with a disproportionately large number of people who are very, very heavy. So instead of being a normally distributed curve, we're just seeing it pushing up a little bit, those who have a capacity for becoming very heavy to become super obese and super, super obese are actually increasing. So for example, in Scotland, where my colleagues in Glasgow are now addressing how we're going to look at this, uh, somewhere between two and a half and three percent of the population fall in the category of being super obese. And that means, again, there's a smaller group, even heavier. And often, most of us are not aware of those people because they stay at home most of the time. And of course, when I was working in a bariatric surgical clinic, uh, my colleagues were faced with individuals in that category, and I should say that the heaviest individual we ever saw in our clinic was 400 kilograms in weight, and that is five kilograms. That is five of me all in one person, and that's the obviously the extreme end or getting towards the extreme end of the that's range. That's 880 pounds. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and those such individuals, of course, need very, very specialist help. Um, would would obviously ultimately require bariatric surgery of some sort but of course even the lighter ones may well benefit from bariatric surgery and there's good evidence of course that bariatric surgery in early diabetes can actually reverse diabetes so that is all accepted that's all there and of course we have so, good so what evidence can, what can South Asians do their, their diets are rich in rice flour sugar and butter right now when you come then to the question of quality of diet, and it's quality and quantity, and the most recent evidence that's developing now is that w we probably all eat far too much carbohydrate. And when you actually look at, uh, I mean, I've, I've been with my dietitians when they've been talking to patients and show them the amounts of the carbohydrate portions that they should eat, they are horrified because the portion of rice, of course, is very small. It's no more than a, a fistful of yes. rice if, if you're trying to lose weight and the portions of other high energy foods are also uh, much smaller than they imagine because you can imagine i'm sure you've seen other people and the, the amounts that people can consume with a plate piled high with rice and then lots of other things on so first of all perhaps we're eating too much carbohydrate the evidence is that we should move towards lower carbohydrate intakes this is for the general population not just for weight loss because again we have to address that separately um smaller portions obviously but the type of carbohydrate and david jenkins uh, he and i were medical students together an extremely long time ago is now still at the university of toronto and he uh, defined the glycemic index back in 1983 which was an index of food where you tested it to see how high the glucose would rise once you took a standard portion of glucose so we now have a whole set of tables that have been worked up in toronto and in Australia in Sydney and in the UK which enable us to take a diet and work out the glycemic index of it and we know from various other lots and lots of studies actually over the decades that low glycemic index diets are a good thing so then it comes to which type of rice should I eat and in fact basmati is better than the um, has a slightly lower glycemic index and the Rice Research Institute in the Philippines is working on producing um, uh, varieties that have lower glycemic index and then of course not everybody eats rice some people want to eat wheat and some people want to eat potatoes can you find a low glycemic index potato the answer is yes you can they don't quite look like normal white potatoes but they're actually quite delicious and they and it's it's all related to the type of starch that's in the potato because they do vary so we know we can change the type of carbohydrate different types of breads have different um different uh, glycemic indexes but the other critical issue is the total amount and the load because it's the load that goes into the body and then gives rise to the metabolic response. And we have really actually, there was a meta-analysis meta of uh, clinical trials published recently on the low carbohydrate diets and you can actually put early diabetes into remission with a low carbohydrate diet. Can be done. Lots of individuals have achieved that. Dr. Um, Leeds, my yes. question over here is once we were talking about the, the causes uh, of this obesity is you mentioned one thing is uh, 
change of uh, metabolism. And you said that I understand we will talk about the diets as well. Um, of course, everything costs. Uh, there are a couple of diets, Atkin diets, uh, Bernstein, Dr. Bernstein here is of course, they guarantee that you lose weight. Uh, there is vegan diet uh, plan. There is a 16 hours in term fasting uh, plan and as you said that uh, control of carbohydrates. Now, improving the metabolism, what is how can people improve their, as Dr. Mutsa said, our lifestyle has changed these days and sitting home, sitting on the desk, of course, that is something which is contributing to lower the metabolic rate. How somebody can improve the metabolic rate? Um, improve the metabolic rate. Uh, okay, so I think the first question is, uh, people have to know where they stand at this point in time before they decide what changes to make. And so we've been talking about diabetes and if somebody uh, has, has a family history of diabetes and if they're overweight um, and if they're older, then there are some online uh, web uh, in interactions that you can do in just a few minutes that will tell you whether or not you ought to go and see your physician uh, to get a blood test just to check to see where you stand, whether you're normal or pre-diabetic or you have diabetes. And if you have diabetes, they, they will advise you to lose weight. If you have pre-diabetes, they'll advise you to lo lose weight. Um, so you can manipulate uh, metabolism by manipulating diet. Um, there's no doubt that there are other factors as well. Uh, physical activity plays an important part in this and a sufficient physical activity doesn't have to be fantastically extreme physical activity there's really quite good evidence that moderate activity but sufficient of it like walking about doing your standard housework light activities is beneficial um so when they come to the question of assessment so it's family history weight uh, physical activity uh, age i'm afraid which is one of those and as yet at the moment you can't change that but of course we also need to bear in mind why is family history important and of course there you come to the question of genetic factors and we know that for obesity there are a very large number of genes that are associated with it one or two of them result in very specific um, types of um, obesity uh, generally we're not yet able to do a genetic screen and say oh yes we can interpret that we can't do that yet but maybe in five years time so there are these factors so in terms of manipulation you have to know where you stand now so my my if you like the last thing I would say at the end of the day if anybody has any doubts they should go to one of those online sites and I've provided three of those one for Canada one for India and one for uh, the United Kingdom uh, there, is, there is one of Pakistan as well, but I couldn't find that online when I w was looking for a link. Um, and it's very easy to do. It just takes a few minutes. Once that's done, you know whether or not you ought to go and talk to a healthcare practitioner or do a doctor. If you don't need to do that because you haven't, you're y relatively young, you don't yet have that, that, there's no family history, and yet you are still overweight, maybe it's, I would advise you need to do something about it. Because one of the other interesting things that we've seen re recently, I work in Copenhagen, I have colleagues in different departments doing different studies and one of the things that was recently done was a weight loss study in apparently healthy obese individuals who ran through a weight loss program but lots of blood samples were taken and in each sample they measured 400 proteins and what was fascinating was that even those who had no existing or known condition actually had some underlying features that would given time cause them to drift towards either high blood pressure or vascular disease, the infl inflammatory markers were high and it rather suggests that although it is quite a popular idea that you can be totally healthy if you are um, obese, that perhaps this may not be true. It needs more work obviously and we need to understand which markers are the really important ones but that evidence is there. It was published a couple of years ago. Dr. Leeds, there's a, a, a belief among South Asians um, that um, Obesity is caused by an individual's indulgence with uh, sweets and desserts. And the question I'm going to ask you is how true it is. Uh, and the reason for this is I'm going to share with you uh, uh, an answer from a friend who is an oncologist in New Zealand. And um, his name is Dr. Krishna Badami. And one, when I was at McGill, we were sitting down on campus and I said, Krishna, doctor, how does what causes cancer? And, you know, without, you know, be wasting a second, he said, well, there's some genetic predisposition 
that is combined with an environmental insult, and that results in, in cancer. So, uh, so I really like the way he explained what causes cancer. You know, some genetic predisposition, some environmental insult, they get together, and there you go, um, the unfortunate incidence of cancer. But is, are South Asians justified in believing that they're, that it's the indulge, overindulgence with sugars, sugar or, or desserts or sweets as, as children or as adults leads to their um, can, diabetic condition or is there other reasons why diabetes um, takes place? Um, I think the answer to that is that there is, uh, your, your colleague was absolutely right in saying it was an interaction between, for cancer between uh, genetic factors and environmental factors and it's actually much more complicated than straightforward uh, direct interactions it can be second generation effects all sorts of interesting things have been observed recently um, and as far as the quality of diet is concerned with regard to diabetes um, again it, we come back to that question of carbohydrate and the total load and the effect it has on the demand for insulin interacting with genetic factors and the predisposition and uh, you could make it all terribly complicated but I think the, the, the message is to say that what is required is individuals probably need to eat less overall uh, and one of the questions that I always ask patients as part of my initial interview although they go to see the dietitian afterwards and have a much more detailed one is what how large are their dining plates and I'm sure it's the same in Canada as it is in Britain and elsewhere that dining plates have enlarged since about 1950 uh, and if you do the calculations on the amount of food you can get on it's increased by something like 30 or 40 percent uh, there's also another very nice paper on the on the size of wine glasses which shows very clearly that wine glasses have got bigger and bigger and bigger so we've been pushed by I don't know I think it may well have been a subconscious effect but by, by people's desire to sell glasses and plates everything's got bigger and bigger and bigger portion sizes are bigger we've got a lot of published papers showing that portion sizes for things like even takeaway foods the, size, the portion size for chips and the portion size for a burger in America has gone up from 1950 through to the most recent observations. Oh, yes. So portion size is an absolutely critical thing. And that portion size issue applies not just to what you might buy or what you might eat out in a restaurant. Although I have to say, one of the things I would like to see is a tax on dinner plates if they're over a certain size. <laughs> but also, when people are eating out, I really would... I really do think we should provide all the information that is needed for people to make an informed choice now some people say oh my goodness me, I don't want that because you know that's going to spoil the event but you know there is a proportion already of the population who would like to know when I go out and of course I haven't been able to do that for a very long time now um, I do like to actually know what I'm going to get in terms of the size of portion because some portions are just ridiculously too big for me as an older person and indeed I'll tell you something else my wife won't mind me telling you this that when we go out together and maybe we're passing through a service station, we would have one portion of fish and chips between the two of us, because that's just about right for us. The, the true, single portion true. is far uh, too big. I, mean, I do it now, um, since I turned 50, that uh, I have started, um, replace, I've replaced my dinner plate with a smaller one, um, for the same reason that I don't have yeah. that kind of appetite, and I, don't, and I think one of the reasons was to, to make a deliberate effort a smaller plate makes a huge difference in the amount of food I consume. I don't yes. know if it's for, for everybody else. It's a sample of one. Yes. Um, yes. So it doesn't really make Dr. it into Bozza, a Dr. once you, you are saying this, and I think so there are departments playing this role in, and they're contributing towards it. As, you, as Dr. Leed said, that the size of the plate is increased, glass size is increased. And mm. I think... Uh, uh, as Dr. Lead in the beginning, he mentioned that the governments and uh, uh, these uh, departments, they are also playing role. When you go for the shopping, you got to be very wise because these days, people sitting home, there are a lot of juices and every juice have uh, a good amount of sugar in it, which is mm -hmm. also a contributor mm -hmm. towards uh, obesity and of course towards the diet. In fact, if you go to the shopping stores in grocery stores, and pay attention to the products that are at your eye level. The eye level products are all carbohydrates. Um, they, they are sugar, chips, sweets, um, and the low caloric, low carb diets or low carb products 
you have to actually bend and look for them Find on the that. shelves below. And that's universal everywhere. Like yeah. when we go out shopping and when I visit Paris or London, um, I realized that the, the eye level retail space is dedicated to carbohydrates. And now is that accidental or it, 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 no, but the, is Dr. it a preference? Dr. I don't know. Dr. Musa, once you're saying this, the governments know that how much it cost onto the health system about the obesity and diabetes and the sicknesses and other things which it causes, but why they do not nip the evil in the bud by controlling uh, these departments where these sugar content uh, products must be removed from the eye level. It is not a coincidence that all the diets with the uh, high carbohydrate content and the sugar content, uh, content are at the eye level. It's not a coincidence. Government knows. And there, there was a, a, an interview. I'm not going to name the the international uh, emirate, but their CEO once famously remarked that crises like these are uh, perfect for them because they sell comfort food. So uh, you know, sodas and mm -hmm. chips. These are comfort foods, but they are devastating for people's health um, because of the amount of caloric intake and the carbs that are in carbohydrates that are embedded in them. So what is your advice if, if uh, let's say we hope that someone from the Ontario government, um, the government, uh, provincial government, health is a provincial matter in Canada. So let's hope that someone from the government of Ontario or some other pro British Columbia are listening to this program. And um, if we one were to advise them for formulating effective policy, policies that are able to deliver some results in improving the health and well-being of their citizens, yeah. what would be your advice to these governments? Uh, well, what you were describing, of course, were the rather complex issues around food retailing, uh, food labeling, um, and all sorts of issues that encourage people to buy, uh, as well as food portion sizes, uh, the sizes of portions that are sold, and also, for example, special offers of two for one. Now, it's a very complex issue, and I'm, I'm, I'm not in any way going to pretend that I know enough about this to to uh, make any, indeed, to give any advice. All I can tell you is the things I've heard from colleagues and from, from my reading. Uh, for example, there was one trial up in the Midlands of England where some large uh, full-scale colour cutouts of your local GPs and your local practice nurses were put alongside uh, places where they wanted guidance to be given. So next to the fruit and vegetable aisles where they were making positive statements and in the other aisles where they were saying, well, you know, be careful with this. And they produced some evidence that showed that the presence of an authoritative, respected figure who they may well know was actually at that point of sale having an effect. Now, that was a very... Uh, brave and courageous store manager who undertook that uh, exercise but it, it's helped to point I think to the sort of factors that make the difference in terms of purchase now you've mentioned having things at eye level or having the confectionery at the till so that the children ask to buy it and so on. all those things um, it's very complex specialists need to address it and governments uh, ought to address it because it does seem to influence the way that people buy things. I think there are other, some, some other related issues, of course, as well, and that is uh, individuals' ability to actually cook. And certainly in the United Kingdom, um, there are now lots of schemes in schools uh, to uh, try to encourage children and, and also parents to learn how to cook because there's been a sort of gen generation missed out. In the past, cooking skills were passed on traditionally, of course, from mother to daughter, but now... Uh, to everybody in the family and I'm pleased to tell you that all my sons know how to cook and can look after themselves properly because they were taught properly by my wife and uh, but that may not be all that common but everybody needs to be able to know how to do basic cooking uh, and it is not the case and it's much easier since um, prepared food is so easy you just pick up the telephone um, hardly any ex energy expenditure to pick up not even go walk to the phone you pick up your mobile phone and order something that arrives at the door how easy it's not hugely expensive for some people very expensive for others um and i think we just make it we've made it unfortunately we made it too easy to eat i can remember the days back in the 19 late 50s and early 60s when if you traveled around at weekends in britain you had to be very careful because you might find yourself unable to find anything to eat because everything was closed the outlets just weren't there you had to take sandwiches with you because you knew you weren't going to find anything it's totally different now until 
February, March of last year, you could find food anywhere at almost any time of the day and night. And, and Western environments... Yeah. Regrettably, Sorry? we are heading in the wrong direction in Toronto, at least. We have businesses that are like skip the dishes, that deliver food. And yeah. in the last few years, we have uh, new uh, condominiums, which are flats in England. Uh, the new design of condominiums or flats are such that they don't have big kitchens and some without actually a proper stove or an oven, which means that the society is heading in the wrong direction. You're absolutely right. The Order the effort the in preparing the food uh, makes helps people make informed decisions, and this this um, you know the app there's an app for everything, and I think there's no app for um, fighting obesity in a way that people make informed decisions when they when they uh, when yeah. they order food. But I'm, I want to go back to this question that um, what advice would you have what, what from the trials and controlled uh, case control studies that you've seen. Um, evidence that cannot be just a coincidence. Based on that, what what advice do you have for governments uh, to help the citizens make informed decisions about food? Um, I think the first observation, and I do understand that some governments and provincial governments have have addressed this already to some extent, would be to take take obesity seriously. I think it's fairly clear that across certainly across Europe. Uh, countries have been rather sort of patchy in their approach to offering obesity services and I don't think I'd be unfair in saying that in the United Kingdom at the moment we do not have adequate obesity management services so when people have a condition that requires that they lose weight in a medically managed way we just don't have the services I do know that you know we don't have enough bariatric surgery let me give you an example my bariatric surgical colleagues would tell you that in the United Kingdom uh, a year ago, we were doing one ninth as many cases as they do in Sweden per head of population. Now, Sweet the Scandinavian countries, of course, have been leading nations for bariatric surgery, but t for us to do b be doing that small proportion when we have a much, much, much larger population is really not very good, and that has not been addressed by government up until now. Perhaps it will be now as a result of what we've seen over the last ten months. Um, but almost every department in a hospital environment or all the, all the specialist cases that are GPCs in primary care, many of those people have conditions which are influenced by weight. So somebody who has cardiovascular disease, somebody who has high blood pressure, I know from all the people I've seen and the clinical trials we've done, that if you can lose 10 kilograms, you'll probably drop your blood pressure by maybe five or six millimeters of mercury. Wow. And if you can keep and if you can keep the weight down, you may well keep that blood pressure down. You'll also be lighter, you can exercise more easily, sleep quality will improve. All of that sort of feeds back in a circle to, to help uh, blood pressure management. So all, many of these things are, are, are interrelated, body weight, metabolism, uh, sleep. Sleep is very important. And that's another interesting area where the trend with all the... Uh, electrical devices everybody has uh, it keeps people awake and you know being sh blue light is being shone in your eyes until you eventually fall asleep and don't have good enough sleep because of the effects that has on your brain uh, we're not getting enough sleep as populations uh, uh, that's Dr. another factor Dr. Leeds I will definitely ask one question over here I know that uh, uh, improper sleep or insufficient sleep is also contributor towards the obesity is that right both ways in fact if you're awake uh, uh, so for example people let me give examples I've had patients who when I do the history will tell me that they watch three or four films in the evening what time do you go to bed oh two o'clock in the morning what time do you have to get up to go to work oh six o'clock in the morning how, how, that's not enough sleep you know and so it's just um, uh, uh, it drives uh, all sorts of things. If, if, you're, if they're sitting up, they'll be eating. We did some experiments when I was at King's College where we showed that if people are watching films or television and they have snacks beside them, they'll eat more in an uncontrolled way. They will be un, unaware of how much they've consumed during that time can, and can consume enormous amounts. Um, that takes us to another issue, which is the portion sizes for fizzy drinks and popcorn in the cinemas. On the rare occasions when I go to a cinema, which I haven't done again for at least a year, um, you know, the portion sizes you see are just huge. Mm -hmm. Those need to change. So portion size. So <laughs> they're, they're, the problem is there's just so much to do. And it really requires a sort of concerted action 
somebody's got to decide that this is a serious problem which is going to well it already is causing a tremendous problem with obesity related coma but it is the major one that everybody's aware of of course is diabetes we we haven't identified most of the people at risk of diabetes but we know the way to do it very simple questions you ask and then you do something about it we know that weight loss is the most important component of both reversing early diabetes and also preventing diabetes that's been shown in some very big trials the science has been done it's it's now really translation into action that's needed and that requires pol political support the, and, and the support from the public and, and so on. There's an enormous amount to do. Thank you very much. I am listening to our program or the program we are watching. We have shared these links. These links are shared by Dr. Leeds. If you want to check your sugar level, then you want to check your sugar level. Those who belong to South Asia, Pakistan, India, Afghanistan, of course, I think it's almost one of them. We also have a link with you. And this again link is shared by Dr. Anthony. اور جو لوگ کینیڈا میں ہیں ان کے لیے ایک الگ لنک ہے دیز لنکس آر ڈیفنیٹی شون آن آر سکرین آپ ان لنکس کو نوٹ کر سکتے ہیں اور یو نو چیک یور شوگر لیول اور اس میں یہ ہے کہ لوگوں کو یقیناً آپ چند ایک سوال پوچھے جائیں گے ان سوالوں کا یو ہیو ٹو آنسر دوز کوئسٹنز کہ آپ کا شوگر لیول کیا ہے یا کس طرف کو آپ جا رہے ہیں اپنے شوگر میں اور اف کورس Obesity is the main contributor towards it. Uh, so, uh, Dr. Musa and Dr. Leeds, uh, my concluding question is, we would like to sum it up what people should do, understand in our conversation, we do, we, we, we mentioned about it, that uh, quality food, low portion of your diet, exercise, and uh, these are the factors. But uh, uh, you were talking about the surgeries as well. Those surgeries are recommended by the doctors only to those who are extra overweight. Is that mm -hmm. right, Dr. Mutsa? Am I, am I wrong somewhere? I think Dr. Leeds mentioned that um, in case of extreme obesity, we are not talking about body mass index of 30 or 35. We are talking about some very severe conditions. And in, in those cases, these such interventions may be required. But I must say, from from the literature that comes from my field, which is transportation engineering, and um, and the works by the likes of Larry Frank, Professor Larry Frank, who is at the University of British Columbia, they have demonstrated for with decades of research showing that putting in some walk, some exercise in your daily routine could do. Uh, a significant change and I'm going to say it in Urdu and Punjabi so that people can get it. The research that has been done in the world, Pakistan, Canada and America, it tells you that if you put a little bit of a little bit, 5, 10, 15, 20, 25 minutes or half an hour, then it will be a very different effect on your health. This is a sedentary lifestyle and especially for our family, which are often in the homes, they live in the outside, Pakistan, Bharat, and here too, it is necessary for them to be in the last senior golden days, گھٹنوں کی تکلیف اور یہ سب اس وجہ سے ہوتی ہے کہ آپ کا جو رہن سہن کا طریقہ ہے اس میں حرکت نہیں ہے تو حرکت کے لیے ضروری ہے کہ آپ تھوڑا بہت چلیں and for the people especially the young generation if you have kids who are teenagers the bigger challenge is to take those Nintendos and PS4s and electronic games away from their hands and let force them be outside of the house kids are spending 5-10 hours playing these video games this cannot be good in any way this there's tremendous amount of research that shows that we are not doing a favor to our children by letting them play this long. Take that away, give them a soccer ball, give them a baseball, a basketball and say, here you go, you want to play? Take this ball, throw some hoops outside, run around, because that would do wonderful things for them, not just now, but for the rest of their lives. You have to change their habits. We, we have to change their ha our habits. Behind me, you would see, is another table which I recently got and that table now allows me to stand and work. I spend about eight to ten hours working mm -hmm. and now I'm making a change. I'm forcing myself not to be seated all the time and I'm going to start working from this table that would, I'll just stand for four or five hours as I do work. I've, I've made some deliberate changes. I'm now dictating 
to my phone so that when I write my columns or my papers, I just go out on a walk and I dictate. And, and that software then translates the dictation into, into writing. But then I'm forcing myself to change and adopt habits because I've lost that five kilometer walk that I had when I used to go to work. So I'm going to repeat it in Urdu. Doctor हमारे मोटापे की और बाजार के बीच में अब पैसे की भी फरवानी होगी हर चीज अवेलेबल है हम खाना भी सब कुछ चाहते हैं अगर हम अपनी लाइफ को भी चेंज नहीं करना चाहते डॉक्टर लीज आई हैव अनदर क्वेश्चन दिस बॉडी इज अ वेरी कॉम्प्लिकेटेड बॉडी इन सिंपल वर्ड्स एंड आई थिंक पीपल एंड अप दिस प्रोग्राम ओवर देयर इन द सिंपल वर्ड्स लाइक सम टाइम पीपल से यू नो आई डोंट ईट एनीथिंग आई स्टार्व ऑल डे बट स्टिल माय वेट डजंट गो डाउन so our body develop a kind of resistance to save everything what we eat would you please explain that so that uh, uh, once people say that i starve all the time but still i'm not losing weight how can you help them um i think there there is evidence now that if people are on a, re- a reducing diet that the, the body does adapt uh, to become more efficient from the point of view of metabolism but it's only accounts for about maybe 100 or 125 calories a day um if they say they're not eating anything yet they can't lose weight then you have to question uh the extent to which they are aware of dietary energy being present in different foods and there's no doubt that uh levels of knowledge about this vary from person to person and that there are individuals who believe they can eat certain things without it having any effect on them. So I I think what I would suggest then is if an individual is in that state that they should um, consult an expert, uh, go and see a dietitian or talk to their general practitioner uh, and and see where they stand then uh, because it's just physically not possible to eat virtually nothing and not lose weight. It's, It's not possible to do. So, in the lighter mood, I would say that uh, living in North America or anywhere, to have the best doctor, I heard about it, to have the best accountant, if you save it, and to have the best lawyer. These three can make a change in your life and, you know, make you a very successful person. But now, Dr. Leeds, add the fourth one. If you want to live a healthy life, everybody must have a dietitian. Is that right? Uh, Well, I think... uh, I think there are other sources of information. Dietitians are the experts. They're properly trained individuals. I spend an awful lot of time lecturing to and, and training dietitians. But uh, there are good other sources of information. But it's difficult for an ordinary person to know what is what is really scientifically valid and what is not. So it, it's often a good idea to get your your information from a professional person who has proper trained and registered and accountable for the advice that they give that applies in engineering as much as it does to um, to dietetics and medical practice so yes go and see your dietitian there are you've got lots of very good dietitians in Canada thank you very kindly dr. Anthony and I definitely look forward to talking to you again and hum yehi uh, weight loss ke bare mein baat karenge uh, dr. Musa aapka bahut shukriya aapne bahut sari achi cheezen ko add kiya uh, anything else what you would like to say at towards the end honga ke choti plate istemal kare kab khaye ghee se istinab kare aur meethe ko magar aapko pata hai ghee pakaye salna wo ek kahawat bhi tha na ghee pakaye salna badi bahu ka naam to ghee jab tak na ho to salan apni rehti to uski fikr kyun kare to aap sirf apni khuraak pe tawajjuh de क्योंकि हम बहसित इंसान हमारे जिस्म जो हैं वो हम जो खुराक हम खाते हैं उसका बाय प्रोडक्ट है अगर हम अपनी पोर्शंस को कम कर दें और घी और मीठे को थोड़ा कम करें तो जो क्वालिटी ऑफ लाइफ है जो जिंदगी की क्वालिटी है वो बहुत इंप्रूव होगी और ये ये बड़ा रिवॉर्डिंग एक्सपीरियंस होता है जब हल्के हल्के धीरे धीरे वजन कम होता है तो आपको एक्सरसाइज करने में भी ज्यादा मजा आता है 
So you, it, it gets easier and easier as you start exercising. Not, I'm not suggesting jogging or running. I'm just saying just add walking and, and stairs, going up and down the stairs. And the more you do it, the easier it becomes. Uh, and the more you push it off for a later date, the more difficult it would become for you to adopt these. So start today, start now. And I can promise you that as soon as this is done, I'm going on a treadmill. मैं आपसे सिर्फ इतना कहना चाहती हूँ कि मैं डॉक्टर एंथनी से भी उनका पॉइंट ले लेती हूँ मगर हम एक बना लेते हैं एक कि पंद्रह दिन के बाद दोबारा जब हमने प्रोग्राम देखना है तो तब तक आपने मार्क करना है कि आपने डेली कितनी एक्सरसाइज की सो डॉक्टर लीज आई जस्ट गेव अ टास्क टू द पीपल दैट इन नेक्स्ट फिफ्टीन डेज वैन वी विल मीट अगेन एवरीबडी हु वॉच दिस प्रोग्राम मार्क इट इन नेक्स्ट फिफ्टीन डेज how many steps you moved uh, how much weight you lost how did you control your food did you um, control or check the plate size where you eat uh, what would you add towards the end dr leeds um being careful about how you do the shopping uh, don't shop when you're hungry people advise that that's one of the standard pieces of advice plan it carefully um and and perhaps consume less uh ready meals brought in uh from outside uh, a dreadful issue of how they cook at home maybe that would be a possibility thank you very kindly dr leeds duniya jahan ke bade programs pe bolte hain we are definitely blessed i thank uh, my brother samiullah sahab bin ke tawassut se dr leeds se meri mulaqat hui और यकीन हम अगर अपनी ज़िंदगी को बेहतर कर लेंगे अपनी सेहत को बेहतर कर लेंगे तो बहुत सारी चीज़ें हमारी और बेहतर हो जाएंगी चलना फिरना बात करना हमारा मूड हमारा बिहेवियर हर चीज़ पे ये असरअंदाज होगा डॉक्टर मुसाहिदर थैंक यू वेरी मच एंड डॉक्टर लीड्स आई थैंक यू वेरी काइंडली एज वेल God bless. Uh, there are some few things attached to Dr. Uh, Leeds' ki jo research. We are also attaching it. And uh, uh, any, I, I look forward talking to both of you again. Is waktijaza dijega. Allah.